the heart and then major blood vessels, right? Some of the arteries and veins that um, are found in the thoracic cavity. Now we have discussed the cardiovascular system last semester in lecture. So a lot of these structures will be familiar. Um, we wanna think about the cardiovascular system as consisting of the heart and the surrounding blood vessels. Um, when you think about the heart itself, it's a muscular pump, it's in the center of the thoracic cavity, a little bit to the left, and it basically distributes blood throughout the entire body, right? It's going to be the source, uh, particularly the left ventricle of the systemic circulation, and then the right ventricle would be the origin of the pulmonary circulation. Now, on that basis, you want to think about arteries in terms of their true definition, they are moving blood away from the heart. So we have four, uh, excuse me, two pulmonary arteries, left and right from the pulmonary trunk. And then we also have the um, typical arteries, like your aorta, which is moving blood away from your left ventricle. And then veins are going to be moving blood towards the heart. So on that basis, we've got four pulmonary veins coming back to the left atrium. And then the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava would be veins towards the left or right side of the heart. So we can think about some of the surrounding structures, the names of those just based on their direction with relation to the heart. Let's look at the heart itself. Now your heart is usually the size of your fist, your clenched fist. So for men, it may be larger, women and children smaller, and it's got four chambers that move blood um, sort of in a rhythmic cycle. We've looked at the cardiac cycle and the phases of that, but the right side of the heart receives poorly oxygenated blood and the left side of the heart receives well oxygenated blood that is coming back from the pulmonary circulation. Okay, so we want to think about the, the function here, kind of that cycle, in order to understand how each chamber functions. Let's look at the position of the heart and some of the surfaces and borders. So the base of the heart is what sits on the diaphragm, the inferior border. This is made mainly by the left atrium, so kind of the back of the heart. Um, and this is also going to be pressed against the esophagus right, the base or back of the heart. Um, excuse me, that base is not the uh, inferior border. I apologize, that was incorrect. The base is gonna be the top back portion of the heart. All right, so think about the base here as being the posterior region where we have the left atrium and the esophagus. The apex on the other end is the pointed region, usually more to the left. This is formed mainly by the left ventricle. And this is going to be in close connection with the lingula of the left lung, right? Sort of pushed off to the left side. And that is mainly left ventricle. Then we have the sternocostal surface. This is the right ventricle mainly. This is sitting right behind the sternum. This is going to be your anterior most facing chamber or surface, right? Here's your sternocostal surface. And then we've got the diaphragmatic surface. So this is the inferior border. So that is easily confused with the base. The base is the top, the back, whereas the diaphragmatic surface is the bottom, which actually sits on the diaphragm. And this is shared, formed partially by left ventricle and partially by right ventricle. Lastly, the pulmonary surfaces. These are the lateral borders where the lungs come in close contact with the heart and um, they're gonna be separated by the pleura, the parietal pleura of the lungs, as well as the pericardium of the heart. So those lateral surfaces would be the pulmonary surface. Let's look more closely at the pericardial sac. So very similar to the pleura, which we talked about. And we looked at how the pleura encircles the lungs, separating them from the mediastinum. Now, the heart also has a serous cavity um, that separates it as well. Now, it's going to have the outer fibrous layer and then an inner serous layer, right? So it actually has this double layer that is reflected to create a pericardial cavity, all right? We've got the pleura, which is right outside the pericardium, 
and then the pericardial sac itself reflected. And then internally, we have the serous layer of that pericardium or the visceral layer. Now, in terms of its function, the pericardial sac is going to help protect the heart from suddenly overfilling. It's going to restrict how much the heart can distend, how much the heart can fill. So it's going to really keep a tight fibrous layer to prevent the heart from suddenly um, overfilling, which is really important for the cardiac cycle and making sure that there's adequate um, volume moving through the chambers with those phases. Let's look more closely at each chamber. So we're going to start with the right atrium, but look at each chamber and talk about some of the unique features and uh, particularly how that is a tie to its unique function. So the right atrium is going to receive poorly oxygenated blood. This is coming back from the superior vena cava, bringing blood from the upper extremities, head, neck, brain. Uh, whereas the rest of the body, think about everything below the diaphragm, that is going to be returned, or the venous drainage of that is returned by the inferior vena cava. So both of those come back to the right atrium. Other features here are the coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus is one of the coronary veins or the veins on top of the heart that drains the heart muscle itself. And that is also returning via this very small opening into the right atrium. Then we have the pectinate muscles, which are unique to the atria, as well as the openings for those veins, superior vena cava opening, inferior vena cava opening, and then we've got the fossa ovalis. And fossa ovalis is really a remnant of a fetal structure. So during embryonic life, there was a hole in the heart. I'm sure you've heard the term, uh, you know, infants are being born with a hole in their heart. And that is actually the remnant from a natural hole. So while you're in the womb, you know, during embryonic life, there is a natural opening between the atria. And this is intentional to prevent blood from going to the lungs because the lungs are not functioning. And so the blood that comes back to the right atrium should go through this opening into the left atrium. Now, after birth, when the lungs become functional, this shunt should be obliterated, all right? And so that is where we get the remnant in adults, which is the fossa ovalis. So the foramen ovale in fetal life becomes fossa ovalis in adult life. And so that remnant can be seen as a, as a feature in the wall of the right atrium as well. We've also got the right oracle. And the oracle is this appendage-like structure. Um, we also hear the word oracle sometimes refer to the external ear. And that is sort of the shape of this, this structure as well. Now, the function of the oracle is really to be an extra chamber. It's going to receive or help the right atrium receive additional venous return. And so it's an additional sort of storage area for some of that excess venous return coming back to the right atrium. We will also speak about a left oracle, but notice that the right oracle is gonna be uh, substantially larger because there's more venous return coming back to the right side. So the right oracle, which is a much larger feature um, in the right chamber. Next, we've got the septum, the interatrial septum, which is the wall that separates left and right atria. And that is where we're going to find these, um, the coronary sinus opening. We're going to find the valve for the vena cava, and we're going to find the fossa or ballus. That Those are going to be in the interatrial septum. Okay, so those are features of the right atrium. Let's look at some of the valves that are found between the atria and ventricle. These are called the atrioventricular valves. These are um, having cusps. They're also associated with the corda tendine and the papillary muscle. So this is what prevents the valves from going back into the atria under the high pressure in the ventricle. And these valves are going to open passively. We talked about the way that pressure gradients are required in order for these valves to open. So when the atrial pressure exceeds ventricular pressure, these valves will open up and blood will move from the atria down to the ventricle. And in doing so, the corda tendine anchors 
the leaflets of the valves to the papillary muscle. And both of these structures working together prevents the backflow of blood, as well as the regurg of the leaflets themselves. Those are anchored into the ventricle. Now on the right side of the heart, the AV valve is the tricuspid. And on the left side of the, the heart, the AV valve is the mitral or bicuspid valve. Okay. And I just want to point out how during diastole, when the ventricle is filling, the blood is moving from atria to ventricle, the valve is open. During systole, when the ventricle is ejecting and ventricular pressure has risen, now we have the papillary muscles and the cord tendine are helping to anchor the leaflets into the ventricle and preventing the regurg of blood or the leaflets themselves from going back into the atria. So that is how these structures work together during both diastole and systole. Let's shift to the right ventricle. And the right ventricle is going to receive that poorly oxygenated blood from its atria, from the right atria, down into this chamber. That is going to happen by way of the tricuspid valve. So here we're going to find some of those structures we just described. The corda tendinae, which are attached to the leaflets of the tricuspid valve, the papillary muscle of the right ventricular wall, and then those are anchored to the trabeculae carnae. And trabeculae carnae is the actual wall of the right ventricle, right? The actual wall of the chamber. So when the trabeculae carnae contract, which is a part of the muscle of that wall, then it's going to pull on the papillary muscles and pull on the corda tendine and uh, bring about that um, stiffening of the valves that we described earlier. Other features that we see here are the pulmonary valve, which are found at the base of the pulmonary trunk, which leads to the pulmonary arteries. Um, this is one of the semilunar valves. So notice the feature or the um, shape of the leaflets here in that semilunar um, shape. And so that is gonna prevent backflow of blood from the arteries into the ventricle, particularly when the atria are filling, right? When the, um, during systole. When we think about the interventricular septum, that is similar to the interatrial septum, but it's separating the ventricles here instead separating the right ventricle from the left ventricle. And we're gonna find some of those features that we described, such as the papillary muscles, trabeculae carnae, within the wall of the septum as well. Okay, let's think about the pulmonary valve more closely. Again, this is a feature of the right ventricle, between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. Here we have no quarter tendine, no papillary muscle. Remember, this is a different type of valve. The semilunar valves are different in their structure and function than the AV valves. And so we're not going to see some of those features that we see with the AV valves here with the semilunar. So notice that we have the cusps here. They actually have the right, left, and anterior cusps. And uh, those help to form the uh, pulmonary valve. Let's look at the pulmonary vessels. So we start with the pulmonary trunk that leaves from the right ventricle. That will then divide into right and left pulmonary arteries. And that is how we can take that poorly oxygenated blood from the heart and send that to the lungs where that can be reoxygenated. So in the lungs, at the level of the pulmonary capillaries, there's gonna be exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen and then that blood can return to the, the heart by way of the four pulmonary veins. So here we have the smaller pulmonary veins, four of them, two from the left lung, two from the right lung, and these are all coming back uh, to the left atrium, which is found at the base of the heart, right? The top uh, portion of the heart. Okay, so now we're kind of moving sequentially to the next chamber in that, um, in that cycle. So left atrium, this is receiving oxygenated blood coming back from the lungs 
by way of the four pulmonary veins. Remember, veins bring blood back to the heart. So we have the left atrium here. And so this is the base of the heart up here, where we have some of the great vessels as well as the left atrium. And so this has the openings for those four pulmonary veins. You can see one of those cut here, and then that is how we can receive that uh, well oxygenated blood back to the heart. Notice we also have a left oracle here as well, a similar appendage that we spoke about for the right, but notice how much smaller the left oracle is. And that is because the volume of blood coming back to the left is much smaller than the volume of blood that comes back to the right. Okay. We also do not have as much pectinate muscle. So on the right side, we have a larger right chamber with more substantial pectinate muscle in the wall. Here, most of the pectinate muscle is only found in the oracle and not as much in the actual chamber of the wall or wall of the chamber. Um, and we can also appreciate the interatrial septum here. Here's the other side of it, as well as the um, feature in the wall where we have the fossa ovalis, the remnant of the foramen ovale. Okay, let's keep going sequentially into the left ventricle. So blood that leaves the right, or excuse me, left atrium makes its way down into the left ventricle by way of the left AV valve, which is the bicuspid or mitral valve. Um, and as opposed to the right side where we saw three cusps for the AV valve, which is the tricuspid, again, we have less volume um, coming back on the left heart. So this is the reason that we have fewer cusps in the left AV valve, right? There's just less of that volume or venous return on the left. Than, the, than there is on the right. We still have some of the other features. We have papillary muscle, we have corda tendine, and then we have the wall of the um, chamber itself forming the trabecular carne. So the trabecular carne is much less significant on the left, as I mentioned, and it's much more significant on the right, whereas the papillary muscles and corda tendine are gonna be seen on both. I also wanna point out the septum here again. So the interventricular septum, similar uh, being that divider between the left ventricle and right ventricle. And then just to point out the functional difference. So notice how much thicker the left ventricle wall is as compared to the right. Okay, I'm gonna go back here to the right ventricle just very quickly. Notice how thin this right ventricle wall is. Okay, the right ventricle has more features to accommodate excess volume, whereas the left ventricle has more features to accommodate excess resistance or pressure. So because the left ventricle has to eject blood against the peripheral resistance that is found in the systemic circulation, it has a much thicker uh, muscular, muscular wall. Okay. Let's look at the next structure in sequence. This is going to be the aortic valve. This is our second set of our, or our semilunar valve here. So this is where we have the openings for the coronary arteries as well. At the base of the aorta, where we have the semilunar valves. Now, here we're going to see the valves are going to be preventing backflow, as we mentioned. So they're going to have these deep cusps um, and then the top of the valve is going to be where the openings of the left and right coronary arteries are originating. So left coronary arteries and then right coronary, excuse me, coronary arteries are both found at the base of the valve. 